So uh, I think we will start the afternoon session and uh, our first talk will be a real organizer, Renato. Uh, he will tell us about black hole from quantum information perspective. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Thanks to the organizers. <laughs> Um, so this probably shows that it's really Arthur who actually is the organizer of this workshop and not me. We had originally planned to have it in Zurich, as Arthur said, and that's, I think that is the only reason why I was involved at some point. But it was, of course, a big pleasure to work with Arthur on um, planning this. So um, I'm going to talk about, um, let's say, an experiment one could do to test whether the evolution um, of a system that involves gravity, like the formation of a black hole, is unitary. And the experiment is maybe not so easy to do in practice. So this is one where I think even Michel Lupin would still have to work on for a few years. But um, it's something that is certainly um, would be very interesting to do, which is um, we create a big shell of masks, spherically symmetric, let's say, and then collapse it. So this is, I have a sequence of four pictures. That's the first. And I imagine here that we have a, an observer outside. He controls the whole shell. So he has kind of a, a spherical detector around everything and can measure all the signals from there. And he could also create that mass shell. I assume it's in a pure state as described by quantum theory. And then this shell collapses for the black hole. So this orange thing indicates the event horizon of the black hole. We have Hawking radiation, which is um, detected or measured um, by the blue detector. And actually, instead of being measured, I prefer to think of it, the blue thing is more like a quantum detector connected with quantum computer memory. So it would just actually capture the whole quantum state of the Hawking radiation and store it as a quantum state. So in that sense, it's not a measurement that turns things into classical information. Then as the black hole evaporates, it becomes a bit smaller. That's indicated here. And finally, it's gone. We don't know whether anything remains. So this green dot may be a remnant if you prefer to think in that way, or nothing if you prefer to think in another way. So maybe a more um, clear for or more precise description would be in terms of a Penrose diagram that you see here, because this is a rather diverse conference with people coming from pure quantum information. I'm not sure that everyone has seen such a diagram, but basically the way you should think of it, if you haven't seen it, is that this is a space-time diagram with the time direction going up here and the radial direction going here and the two other spatial angular directions are neglected. So you should think of this direction as a spherical radial coordinate where the center is here. And at some point it's suddenly drawn here. And the reason why it's distorted in that way um, is that this diagram should be a causal diagram such that any point in this space-time, let's say a point here, can only, or the, the light um, cone, the future light cone, always looks like this 45 degree angle cone or 90 degree, however you measure it, it's rated 45. And so you can always in this diagram decide that something like this point lies, for example, in the causal future of that second one. And this is a, the, the price you pay for that is the whole rest is extremely distorted. So this is spatial infinity. That's where R is infinitely large at any time. And these lines are basically um, Cauchy slices or, or um, slices where one could say the, um, they are um, representing space at the particular time. So, for example, this slice here has this number one. This will be the time when the mass, which is here, here has this green world line, the mass shell is um, still on the way to collapse. Then the second slice already sees a horizon, and you see in this. Um, Penrose diagram, the horizon is a 45 degree line. So it's something that has the same structure as a, a light signal coming out, which makes sense because that just means that once you're inside, the future light cone stays inside. And um, then the third slice is just still similar, but black hole is now smaller. You don't see that in this diagram. 
And the fourth one is at the later time when the event horizon is no longer there. So the details of that diagram don't matter too much if you are um, if you haven't seen it before. The only thing you should remember is that this right hand sides could be seen as boundaries. There are things that are very far away. Um, and these are the light-like past and the light-like future. This is where all light comes from and goes to, um, which is radially, um, which is radially directed. Okay, so for the moment, what I said is just we can in principle do this experiment. And now the question people that are asking is, is this whole process unitary? So maybe if I briefly go back, if it was unitary, we would expect that if this green matter was in a pure state, then the whole radiation, which is then this detected and stored in a quantum memory, as I said, would still be in a pure state. That would be an implication of this being unitary. And conversely, if this is true for any pure state and can prepare here, then it would indeed be unitary always. Now, um, whether or not it's unitary is, is a question, as you see here. And I think it's still a, an unanswered question. But in order to study the question, one thing to do is to, I mean, to make it a bit more quantitative, is to picture the entropy of the radiation depending on time. So here in this diagram, as an exception, time goes to the right. So you see here, this is again, this first picture we had before the black hole was generated, there is clearly no radiation. Therefore, the entropy, which is shown on this axis is zero. Then a bit later, as the black hole is formed, it radiates. So as one would expect that somehow um, the amount of entropy grows with the radiation, as this would be the case for the, if the radiation was just something completely thermal. And of course, the exact shape here of the curve is not relevant. You can always define time in such a way that it looks more or less linear here. But of course, the amount of radiation depends on the size of the black hole. It will be it will turn hotter as the black hole gets smaller. But then there is an important point, which is here, um, this so-called page time, which is the point where half roughly or half of the black hole has evaporated and turned into um, radiation. Namely, if you assume that this whole process is unitary, then it's clear that at the very end point, so this is the time when the black hole has evaporated, it corresponds to that point here in this diagram, um, the entropy should again be back to zero, as I said. So um, the entropy of the whole radiation has to be zero because as I said before, the, the radiation would be in a pure state. And um, so if it's zero here, it has to turn down again at some point. So once it goes up, it has to return. And the expectation is really that this is at roughly half time. And this is due to the fact that if you model the black hole basically as a randomly chosen unitary, randomly chosen but fixed unitary, then it has a typical behavior that the system has and the typical behavior that a quantum system has that undergoes a random unitary is that it will completely mix things on on the subsystem and that means on the global system it's always as much a tanglet between the inside so you, you should imagine like if i look at this time slice here for example the third one then there is a part of the whole matter is still inside the black hole still exists and has a positive mass but some part is already radiated out and these two ingredients are maximally entangled for a typical unitary and for and max i mean by maximally entangled i mean it's as much as entangled as it can be given the sizes of these systems so as long as the radiation system is much smaller than the black hole then it's really the um, radiation system that dominates how much entangled it is and the entanglement entropy will correspond to that entropy here so that's why it grows here with the size of the radiation but after this point the black hole is smaller than the total radiation and then the black hole size will dominate how much entropy there can still be left and as the black hole now gets smaller and smaller it decreases and reaches here zero when all the radiation is out so that's the curve and this is known as the page curve because i think Page um, wrote this famous paper 
um, a long time ago about um, this typical unitary behavior. In contrast to that is the calculation by Hawking, which um, used basically a, a model with um, quantum fields here and curved space time, where he concluded that um, the entropy should always grow up to a maximum when all is turned into radiation. And then of course, nothing happens any longer. So it stays constant. Here. And you see the curves are maximally different after this so-called page time. So here we have the largest possible gap that is information theoretically allowed. So they're really very different predictions. Now you probably noticed that I wrote here just entropy and wasn't more precise. And this was actually on purpose as we will see later. But for the moment, um, I should just remind you that there are different entropy measures one could use. And the entropy measure this really refers to normally is the so-called von Neumann entropy, whose definition you see here. And I think this is pretty familiar to most of you. There are also so-called Rennie entropies, which are defined here. And the important property is not this definition for the moment. The important property is that they have a parameter alpha, which is a real number, a positive real number different from one. And the important property is this lemma here, namely that if you now take the limit of alpha going to one from below or above both works, you get the von Neumann entropy back. So this is very useful because this uh, expression here has a logarithm only outside of the trace, as you see here, whereas here the logarithm acts directly on the quantum state. And such an object is generally easier to calculate. Of course, we still have here an exponent. We will have to deal with that, but it's already good that the logarithm is here. So it's kind of a calculational tool to get entropies to look at this quantity here. I mean, to get the von Neumann entropy to first look at this and then use this lemma. Now, how do we then calculate the Rennie entropy? There's a, a method which is very widespread, not, I mean, in different branches now, quantum information, solid state physics, and also gravity, um, which is called the replica trick, where you calculate this Rennie entropy for the special case where the alpha, which has to be different from one, is a natural number. So in this, case, you can write, I mean, this is still the same formula, I just replaced the alpha by an n. But then the important observation is that here you have an, um, a product of n times the same state. So it's just rho times rho times rho times rho n times. And this can be written in a different way. It can be written as the n fold tensor product of rho times an appropriately chosen operator, which spans over all these n copies of the space in which rho lives. So you basically just take really n copies of a system, and this is an n system operator, which um, is here defined. Um, so it's basically a swap operator. What the operator does, it just takes one system and maps it to the next one in the sequence of n cyclically. But that's maybe not even that important to have this definition if you haven't seen it before. The important thing that from this um, whole slide here is that this thing here, this expression looks like, like an expectation value. Namely, it's really the trace of some state, an n-fold product state, times an operator. And this is a permission operator, by the way. So I can regard this quantity, this trace here, as an expectation value of an observable. That's the um, kind of crucial property of this. And because it's now an observable and an expectation value of an observable, I can apply methods that are designed to calculate the expectation values. And one of these methods is, of course, the path integral. And the path integral is a method where we have at least some idea or some, of course, still conjectures of how we can apply that in the context of gravity. So even if we cannot describe the Hilbert space in which system, these systems live in, 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 in a quantum gravity theory, we can still evaluate path integrals under certain semi-classical assumptions. So the point is now that if we now go back to the black hole setup and we imagine there is some time evolution, which I describe here by U, and I will not necessarily assume that the, um, everything is unitary. I just 
so maybe for a certain time here, this time evolution is unitary, but maybe then the part is cut off here. That's by the way, the singularity of the, of the black hole. So it could be a unitary followed by a trace, which would of course not be unitary. But in any case, what happens um, um, kind of conceptually is that we prepare a matter state rho m, then it evolves according to some unknown evolution. And then we have this observable. And so if we just had some, so here I didn't put tau. Tau is a, an observable on n black holes. Imagine first that we just want to measure any other observable on the radiation of a single black hole. So this would be a detector placed here far away. This is this boundary very far away from the black hole. And we put an observable here, then we could say, um, we can, um, an expectation value of such an observable corresponds to um, this trace here. Now, one important property of, of path integrals is that we can calculate them by just talking about the boundary conditions. And then of course we sum over everything that happens in between, but we don't need to know what happens in between. We just sum over all possibilities. So the idea of this diagram here is just to show you instead of now assuming that there is this singularity and the event horizon and everything, we just say, if you want to evaluate the path integral, we only need to know here um, things that are at the boundary. So this is basically the past boundary where the matter shell is created. And this is kind of the, the relevant boundary where the observable is evaluated. And we just need to basically have access to those. And the difficulty that now arises is that this observable that really interests us, this tau n, is not an observable for one single black hole, it's for n black holes. Um, remember that this was this formula here. So it really acts on n copies of a black hole. So we should really imagine we have n black holes and this tau observable is an observable that acts on all radiation fields at the same time. This makes a lot of sense sense probably for any quantum information series because to measure an entropy, we need many copies of a system. So clearly if I have an observable that is supposed to reconstruct the entropy, I need to apply it to many copies of a system. So in, in terms of the Penrose diagram, this same thing looks like this. I have these boundaries here, which define the states. And I have these future boundaries which, on which the observable tau n is defined. And these boundaries of the space they can be connected. So these blue lines indicate that, of course, that, I mean, it's kind of this diagram. So the blue line that is far away is, the, is a common boundary of all black holes, but the inside here is different. So these are the different black holes and the blue boundary is the common boundary. And this is again common because this tau n applies to all radiation. So now we just apply this, gravitational path integral technique, which allows us to um, calculate an expectation value. So the expectation value we want to evaluate is this tau n observable applied on n copies of the radiation system. And I could also write it like this, assuming that um, the evolutions of the black holes are described by an operator u, which may also involve a trace. So this is not assuming that it's really unitary, but that's just a way to write it in terms of the initial matter state. Now, what I did so far is basically to describe to you the common procedure or one common procedure, not the only one, to, evaluate, to calculate the entropy of a black hole. So, or not of the black hole, but this would also work, but of the radiation in this case. So the first step, as I said, was to use the gravitational path integral to calculate these Rényi entropies for integer n's. Then um, we have to let alpha go to one. This doesn't work for integers, so you need to have an additional intermediate step where you analytically continue whatever you find to real alphas, except for one, and then you take the limit of alpha going to one. So that's what people are doing who are calculating the entropy. Let me now briefly talk about um, a bunch of or a series of results that have been achieved in 2019 and later by um, mostly groups in Princeton and Stanford. And you see here um, a list of some of the papers that um, were um, contributing to this breakthrough. Um, 
So people did this calculation that I just described. And I didn't say much about the gravitational path integral. I just said we apply it. But applying it means you sum over everything that happens here in between. Now, it's a gravitational path integral, so you don't only sum over all, all, over all configurations of the quantum field, you also have to sum over all configurations of the space-time background of the space-time geometry. So what you do is basically in, this, in these calculations, you still assume that the space-time geometry is classical, but you consider different possible configurations. So it's a kind of semi-classical approach in, in the sense that you look at semi, you look, look at saddle points in the path integral corresponding to classical geometries of the space time. And one geometry is, of course, that, the, in, that these black holes are just the black holes we know that have this event horizon that are known from the Einstein solution of, or the Schwarzschild solution. And um, OK, I should say in the actual calculations that are done, it's in a, in a simplified model. Um, for two-dimensional gravity, but let's just um, think of this in a more abstract terms. So these are just, the, let's say, individual solutions where the, we have these individual black holes, and that's called the Hawking saddle because that's what Hawking basically did. But the breakthrough was really to dis discover the relevance of another saddle point of the geometry. Namely, if you have now these n black holes, there could also be a geometry where they are inside somehow connected by wormholes. And this diagram is, is a bit simplified. So if, if you later have questions, I have some extra slides to give you a more precise one if you're interested. But basically, the idea is really at the inside, these black holes are connected. That's a possible geometry. And you just have to include that geometry into your, your gravitational path integral. And if you do that, you find a different result. Um, then what Hawking found, namely, you reproduce the page curve. So by, by this, let's say, insight that actually it's not only the trivial geometry, but also these wormhole geometries, people were able to reproduce this page curve. And so this gives, of course, a lot a strong support for unitarity. I still have a question mark here. So, okay, maybe for time reasons, let me not go through all the questions. Let me focus on the most important point that I want to make now. So I, I mean, in this experiment, we have to prepare n black holes. So we prepare n matter states in a product state, so to speak. And however, it's not clear if you look at now this picture and assume that the black holes are connected at the inside, this means they could also be correlated. It's no longer clear that actual radiation state that you have after parts of the black hole have evaporated is still in a product state. That's just not implied if we are no longer assuming that the geometries are the geometries of individual black holes. So we simply cannot assume that the radiation state is of tensor product form. However, this was the main ingredient to the replica trick. So in some way, one could say one is now in trouble. Was it in retrospect justified to apply the replica trick if the calculations show that Generally, the state may be correlated between the different black holes or, or somehow not a product state. So the problem is we don't have this situation. We rather have something arbitrary, which could arise from complicated geometries in between the black holes. So now maybe you notice I turned, I put here another substrate because that's just a different quantity now. So if I don't put here a product state, it's no longer what we we expect from the replica trick. So we can now ask the question, what did these people actually calculate? Because they supposedly did use the replica trick, but it, it wasn't a maybe not a product state. It's even their finding that it's probably not one. Here is the point where quantum information enters. And I just very briefly mentioned a theorem, which is called the quantum definiti theorem. Maybe many of you know that theorem. It's kind of really used very broadly, mainly actually quantum cryptography, because there we have a very similar situation to black holes. We have something that we have an adversary, and instead of the adversary, you have a black hole. But in both cases, we don't know what he's doing and are kind of making worst case assumptions. So, what does the theorem tell us? The theorem tells us that if we 
just have n systems for a large number of n, which are have identical size. So they're finite dimensional systems. And you pick from these systems um, a number small n of systems out. So you have just S1 to S small n, there were capital N many systems. Then you could ask what's the structure of the state of these systems that you picked. So it seems like there's almost nothing you can say about this because I didn't say anything about the initial state of all those, but what I said is you randomly choose these subsystems um, R S1 to Rsn. Now the definite theorem tells you the following. It tells you that the state of these sus subsystems is basically to a good approximation, provided that this condition holds a convex combination of product state. So this is a product state, and these are just weights, and this is a sum over weight. So this is just a convex combination of states of that type. And that is a very, it's, that's a very strong structural statement. So we basically um, know that if you have a situation where we look at a certain small number out of a large number of systems, we can almost most generally assume of finite dimensional systems, I should say, we can assume that they have this, the joint state has this structure. So we are almost back with the product state and could say now maybe still the replica trick was just it was justified to, to say that we still get the same entropy. However, that's not the case. And um, so we now have to replace this. So we can say we can apply this definite theorem because we can say the replica copies of the black hole, we consider them as the basically the um, n for some number n of, of black holes that were randomly chosen out of an even larger number of black holes. Physically, that shouldn't make a difference if I have even more black holes and choose n of them at random. So what we did is basically to apply the definite theorem to this state, which tells us it has this form. And then we can ask ourselves, what's now the entropy that comes out? What was really the entropy people were calculating? And the result is on this slide. What, we, what comes out, if you just use that definite theorem and pull, plug that in, you find that the entropy, once you do this analytical continuation and let alpha go to one, that you actually compute by applying the gravitational path integral is this entropy here. This is not the entropy of a single black hole, it's called the regularized entropy. It's the entropy of the radiation of n black holes normalized by the number of black holes in the limit where you have many holes. So the point is, the curve that was actually coming out of um, these new calculations in 2019 that has this shape, is not calculating the von Neumann entropy. Most generally, it's calculating. If you have many black holes, let them all radiate and look at the joint entropy normalized. So now you could say, okay, this gives now room to say that both Hawking, who calculated this curve, and the new calculations are both correct. They were just just calculating different quantities. And if you take this view, which is supported by, as I said, this argument, using definite this argument, then you could say this just shows that if you accept that the single black hole has follows this curve, the radiation of the single black hole is ever growing the entropy, whereas for many black holes, because of, of this, what I just explained, this um, argument goes down, this means that if you, for example, have two of them, that there's a positive mutual information between the radiation fields. So in other words, this argument together with these curves that have been calculated in, seem to imply that there is correlation between radiation fields of um, several black holes. Okay, maybe because time is almost, no, let me just make one last point. The question is how could we imagine what that means? I mean, what does this really tell us that several black holes are correlated? This doesn't make sense because we somehow created n black holes individually. And now I'm saying after they radiate, their radiation is correlated. One explanation 
which is just now a model. This is now quite speculative, is the following. So imagine a model in which a black hole is generated out of matter which has no spin direction. So I just do something artificial. I create a universe in which matter has, most matter has no spin. So this is spinless matter. But I assume that in this theory, there's still fields which sometimes, I mean, there are fields for spin one half particles, but they are kind of on a higher energy scale. And I tune everything in such a way that on average, a black hole up to the evaporation to a certain size will only emit one single spin one half particle. And all the other particles emitted are still spin zero matter. Now, clearly the initial black hole had no preferred spin direction. It has total angular momentum zero, but the first spin particle that is spit out breaks this symmetry. So it has some spin direction. And the question is, what is now this direction? Now, clearly, if I'm in a universe where I didn't have any spins so far and created a black hole, and then the first spin emerges, this first spin will anyway look random to me because I simply have no direction reference. However, if I now create many identical black holes and they all behave according to the same, if you like, unitary, all these spins that come out will have the same direction. So in that sense, it looks as if there is a correlation between the black hole or between the radiations, but it was just a radiation because I didn't have a reference for that spin that was sent out. So this would be the picture of that. And that, that model is, would, would be an example. I'm not claiming this is what's happening, but I'm just saying this would be an example that would support these curves that I had here. So According to this model, the, um, the spin that would come out would be random, even at the very end if everything has evaporated, whereas the regularized entropy, which would be the joint entropy of all spins spit out by all these black holes divided by n would still go to zero. Okay, so um, I, I'm already at the second conclusion. I skipped the first. The first was just to say, um, one conclusion is that this is another example where quantum information tools can help us doing research in gravity. And I think the purpose of my talk is to motivate further interactions between quantum information people and gravity. This is, of course, already happening, but I think it could be even more um, extended. And um, I think this is an example where this Definetti theorem, which is a quantum information theorem, can help us understand things in the context of gravity. First, you have to wait for the microphone. Second, you have to say your name slowly. Uh, this is Mike Friedman. I was confused about the uh, wormholes that you discussed. Mm -hmm. I would understand if you had actual black holes that maybe there'd be some connection between their interior, but I, the replica trick looks like just a mathematical device. So how can there be, what does it even mean to think that there's wormholes between them? You, you just take identical copies and they're disjoint union, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, this was actually one of the questions I skipped, but this is um, exactly, of course, how people would typically describe this. And they say, this is just a mathematical trick. And um, so the, at the end, they're talking about one single black hole and the radiation of that single black hole. I think the point here is not to claim that there is real black holes are really correlated. The claim is the following, that if you take this calculation seriously, we have to acknowledge the fact that um, the calculation doesn't assume I mean, the path integral, because it has this summation over the ge geometries, doesn't guarantee to you that there, even if the, the initial matter were in a so-called IID state, the radiation is still in an IID state. So the first one, this is just, there's no reason why this should be the case. So I'm kind of turning it around and say, there's just no argument for that. So it could be that this is the case. Now, what we are basically now saying is that Okay, if we just drop the assumption that the radiation is still independent, we can still do the whole analysis using that definite theorem because that theorem is precisely developed for cases where you have arbitrary correlation between unknown systems. And the definite theorem now tells us 
that we still have enough structure to interpret the calculation that was done. And the interpretation of the calculation is now that it corresponds to this so-called regularized entropy. And now if we take the result of the calculation series and see that the regularized entropy goes down to zero at the end, but we also take Hawking's calculation series and say that the single black hole has ever-growing entropy, then it's a consequence that n black holes still within this model, of course, are actually correlated. But of course, there are many assumptions that lead to that. So I, I really don't want to claim that as too strongly. I just want to say that um, the, if you take these things, if you take both results as valid results, like we just believe both are correct in the sense that all the assumptions that entered it are good assumptions, then this is a, uh, a necessary consequence that within these models, within which these calculations were done, um, the multiple black holes which are created identically would be um, correlated. And I think the reason why I gave this model at the very end with the spin tries to illustrate that this correlation could just mean, you know, things are look correlate to us, even if they are not. If you give me n spins which are equally directed, and I just know you, you, you give me these equally directed spins, but don't tell me the direction, then to me they look correlated, although you just prepare them in a fixed direction. So correlation is a very relative term. So to say that the black holes are correlated is kind of maybe a more observer-dependent statement because we didn't know this, let's say the reference, so I see it like that we don't have maybe the reference system that would be required to really make full sense of the radiation, because maybe there are even new types of particles created, which we have never seen, so some colors of new quarks. So these would look random to us, but just because we, we cannot compare them with a reference. So in that sense, um, it's a very relative statement. Okay, I will talk to the others later. Thanks. Yeah.